We've said that critical reasoning is a matter of argument. And arguments take two forms, deductive arguments and inductive arguments. But either way, there are two relevant questions to ask of any argument of any kind. First, are the premises true? And second, do the premises really give me reason to believe the conclusion? Now the terminology is a little bit different depending on whether we're talking about a deduction or an induction, but the ideas are principally the same. Let's look at an example of a deductive argument. I'm going to use a few nonsense words in this argument. That's by design. This first premise says that all binkles are gabos. Okay? Here comes the second premise. Second premise, some binkles are not feeners. Okay? More nonsense words. And now we have a conclusion. The conclusion says that some gabos are not feeners. Okay. Now you might be asking yourself, how can we say anything productive about this argument at all, given that we have no idea what these words mean? But this is exactly the power of logic and critical thinking. Okay? Because <clears throat> regardless of what these words mean, binkles, gabos, feeners, we can say something about whether this argument is deductively valid or not. And in fact, this argument is valid. Let's take a look. All binkles are gabos. Now, the second premise says that some binkles are not feeners. Well, what do those things together tell us? Well, in fact, they tell us this, that some gabos are not feeners. Right? <clears throat> what does it take for an argument to be valid? Well, it means that there's no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So let's try to imagine just that, that the premises are true and the conclusion false. Well, if it were false that some gabos weren't feeners, well, that would be to say that all gabos are feeners. But if all gabos are feeners, then, since all binkles are gabos, all binkles would have to be feeners too, but the second premise says that some binkles are not feeners. Okay. Now, the whole point of this is that the terms binkle, gabo, and feener are irrelevant. Right? What matters is this kind of structure, the relation that these terms bear to one another, as this argument illustrates. Okay? So we can, in fact, replace the term binkles with something else. We could replace the term gabos with some second thing, and replace the term feeners with some third thing. And the validity of this argument won't change at all. Okay? This argument will be valid no matter what these different terms mean. Okay? Because here, as in most cases, Validity is a matter of the form of the argument. Okay? That's what we mean by the form. Take out anything for binkles. Right? Replace it with any term you like. Do the same for gabos and for feeners. And you'll be guaranteed to get a valid argument. That is, no matter what these terms mean, there's no way that these two premises can be true and the conclusion false. Okay, that's deduction, and that's validity. That is, the premises really do give us a reason to believe the conclusion. In fact, if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. Now, as to whether this argument is sound, well, that we don't know. Because for soundness, we need to know whether the premises are in fact true. And in order to know that, we have to know what these words mean. Which, of course, we don't. They're nonsense words. Okay? But that's the power of validity. And notice, in particular, again, that it's quite independent of uh, what these words actually mean. We can know that it's valid just by looking at the form of the argument. Okay, that's deduction. Let's look now at induction.
induction works a little bit differently. <clears throat> but we still have the same two questions. Are the premises true? And do the premises really give me a reason to believe that the conclusion is true? Now, <clears throat> here's a key difference. In the context of a deduction, when we're asking whether the premises give us reason to believe the conclusion, what we're really asking is whether the premises meet the very strong condition of guaranteeing the truth of the conclusion. We want to know whether it's even possible for the premises to be true and a conclusion false. And if it is, then the argument won't count as valid. But if we're talking about induction, well then again the standard, as we talked about last time, is much lower. And the, the crucial question is not whether the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion, but whether they make the conclusion likely. Okay. And then of course the question about the truth of the premises is the same as in the case of deduction. Are those premises true or not? So for example, here's a classic sort of case of induction that's a kind of generalization. So we might have premises that look like this. Premise 1 says, crow 1 is black. Premise 2 says, much the same, but about a different bird, crow 2. Crow 2 is black. Okay. <clears throat> and suppose we get a few of these premises corresponding to that same number of crows. Let's suppose we have n premises based on the observations of n crows. And our conclusion is going to be the inductive generalization that all crows are black. Okay, same questions as before. First, do the premises really give us reason to believe the truth of the conclusion? Okay, And the crucial property here in this context of induction is not validity, as in the case of deduction, but what we now call here strength. Okay? <clears throat> and I think it's pretty clear that the strength of this argument depends on the size of n. Well, how many premises are there? That is, how many crows have we seen to be black? Okay? The greater n is, that is, the more crows we've seen, the stronger the argument. If n is only one or two, then the argument doesn't look very strong at all. But if n is much higher, say 50 or 100, or perhaps in the thousands, well then the argument looks to be much stronger. <clears throat> now, given that we have a strong argument, the question about whether the premises are in fact true is not, as in the case of deduction, a question about soundness, but what we now call cogency. Okay. <clears throat> so, is this argument cogent, given that it's strong? i.e. that n is sufficiently high? Well, that depends. It depends on what birds these names actually name, crow 1 and crow 2 and so forth. If they do indeed pick out n different crows and they've all been black, then the argument is cogent. Notice, however, that no matter how big n is, no matter how strong the argument seems, is, still, the conclusion will not be guaranteed. right? We will never have the kind of certainty that we get with a deduction. No matter how many crows we seen, have seen, still it will be possible for some crow out there not to be black. That is, for it to be false that all crows are black. Okay? But the bare possibility of that doesn't seem to threaten the possibility that this argument can indeed be strong. And if our premises are true, cogent. Okay. So much for induction and deduction. <clears throat>